Um, hi there, I'm Richard Hyam. I'm a University of Brighton PhD student. Uh, I'm funded by uh, EPS RC um, and I work with Historic England and Trenton Peak uh, trying to look at evaluation trenching in the uh, commercial archaeological system, which is most of our archaeological work in this country at the moment. Um, and it's, it began as a, a continuation of Hay and Lacey and... Do I just press up? Down? Uh, um, so it began as a continuation of uh, a Hay and Lacey study in 2001 and Ruth Waller's work in 2008, trying to look at how we're prospecting and what we're missing. It's quite a big project, and uh, I'm, I think I've fallen short of answering all the questions I wanted to answer at the beginning of setting out. But So what I'm going to do in this presentation is quickly take you through modelling um, trenching layouts just in isolation and how looking at trying to work out what false negatives we might be getting and what we might be missing by simulating trenching layouts over hypothetical sites. And I'll give you a tiny little bit of some of the data, of uh, some of the results I've got. And then, funnily enough, the next part of my project was actually this idea of maybe truthing geophysics data by creating an environmental model and looking at how much data we might be gaining on top of trenching, because actually we might be able to assign our resources better in the evaluation services. So it's actually something which has been covered by two people already, so hopefully I'll breeze through that. Right, so the main thing is that, uh, to begin with, is that evaluation since PPG 16 has become a cornerstone of our archaeological work and um, our, the archaeology industry in the UK today. Um, we're required to do it by law. I mean, not every site, of course, goes to archaeological evaluation, but um, archaeological fieldwork-wise, evaluation makes up a lot of our fieldwork in the industry today. And I did a survey, um, a very loose one, uh, about a year ago, and I asked a lot of county archaeologists about their rules of thumb practice. And although um, county archaeologists were very specific and they made it very clear that each site is um, assessed on its own merits and there are um, no kind of rules of thumb. They were very kind and also did then give their rules of thumb. And because um, <laughs> there are, and, and different counties have got different, um, I suppose, challenges and different planning authorities value planning decisions differently and have to accommodate for different things. But the main thing was that we have different levels of trenching. We have different amounts of trust in the geophysics data. To some degree, that's actually how well the geophysics is working in these different areas. But so now we're just going to, this is just going to whiz through the trenching model. So what I, um, because trenching is still the most commonly employed technique uh, in UK archaeology, when I say technique, I mean field evaluation technique. I'm skipping past the entire desk base assessment and um, that part of the evaluation process. I'm talking about field evaluation here. And uh, what I was trying to look at is what, when we're getting these false negatives and what types of features we might be getting in these false negatives and what are the consequences of that in archaeological evaluation and our interpretation of the archaeological record. So, and uh, one of the big things about archaeological evaluation is that it only happens once, or in HS2's case, twice. You, we, I saw two, two phases of trenching, and sometimes there's more. But actually, what we get, and previous studies interpreting how effective evaluations are, is it looks at, we look at the evaluation data, and then we look at the subsequent mitigation data. And we're able to look at how well the evaluation predicted the mitigation, but we're not able to see how well the evaluation missed the thing we missed, apart from in some rare sites where you know, we find them afterwards. So what I did is I created a very, very basic model uh, where we look at different trenching layouts at different percentages over hypothetical archaeological sites. Um, I looked at, uh, so that here are three, the three trenching layouts I'm looking at. I'm now actually looking at five, so the continuous at the end, which is used um, 
much more commonly in Europe, I'm looking at that, uh, or, or mainland Europe, I should say, sorry, uh, is uh, at wider trenching because they don't do it uh, to two metres, they do it usually to four or six metres um, wide. But in England, the most commonly employed, if we do lay out a grid, which again, I've been told we don't do very often, but actually in the archaeological data, often when we're looking at these blank areas, we lay out grids. For example, in HS2, I think people used the herringbone layout, um, and that's over a huge area. And standard grid has previously, this is known as standard grid, been proven by Hay and Lacey and other um, modelling uh, to be the most effective at identifying features. Previous studies modelling uh, layouts of trenching have looked at how well they find sites. What my modelling looks at is what is found in the sites and the variation of what is found if, from repeating and repeating these evaluations. So as I said, what we're also looking at is the different percentages and I go from 1 to 15%. I stopped there because after 15% I felt that people, you're almost in excavation territory and that to ask somebody to, um, I, I, I think it's unreasonable in practice to trench beyond that level. Um, and I don't think developers uh, or archaeologists could expect that. One of the interesting things about evaluation, which I can't answer, which is one of the key questions about evaluation, is we're not trying to get maximum for maximum information gain. We're trying to get enough information to make the decision about the next stage. I can't tell you how much information that is, that because it's highly specialised on which area, and archaeology is about value judgment. Um, but what this is hoping to show is what kind of information we might be missing, which might then allow people to inform their valuable judgment better. So one of the things to look at is actually the size of features, that because you know, features vary in size. So I looked at not only different percentages of trenching, uh, or for the hypothetical archaeological sites, I had three different feature sizes, which is small, which is uh, a, a meter diameter, um, large, which is this large circle, which is 10 meters um, uh, across, and then a 30 meter long, uh, 30, one by 30 meter long shape. And so this is this kind of simplified model is shapes. How good are shapes at finding shapes? Um, and so here are our nine hypothetical archaeological sites. And after we did this, I'm able to put in just plan data and see how well these trenching layouts, for example, find the mitigation on Heathrow. But I'm not showing you that, so I'm sorry to talk about that. But uh, another thing I was looking at is the, uh, whether the density of finds on site affect the inclusions of your evaluation, and also whether or not the layout of the features on site affect your evaluation. Um, so here, here are the nine hypothetical sites. Uh, random is just the features laid out randomly. The types are meant to represent different periods of archaeology, because then we can begin to see if our evaluations are skewed just based on how well different quantities of features show up in our trenching layouts. So um, without further ado, here's some uh, very quick uh, results. So this is just a standard grid layout of uh, which we saw earlier of the kind of trenching going up and then horizontal. Um, and it's on each, so to, on each bar, this is 800 simulations over each site. Each of these graphs, I know it shows si um, uh, 16, but so here's our previous site, high density at the top, medium density at the bottom, low density of features at the bottom. This is by number of features, this kind of orange and red, and the blue is the area of your features in the trenches what you're, that you're seeing. And what we see, um, so each bar is 800 simulations of the trenches laid out randomly, although keeping their configuration uh, and at a different rotation at a different coordinates over the site. And we're seeing that actually, this is also the total amount of features. This isn't by shape or size. This is just all the, this is, this whole graph is just by um, all the features. Uh, that actually, you get a huge amount of variation 
with your sparse, um, sparsely populated archaeological sites. We're actually getting, are we um, bad at finding, are we at risk of completely missing our sparsely populated archaeological sites? Because in our evaluations, except certainly at the low percentages of trenching, which is actually the kind of percentages that we usually trench at, which is kind of 2 to 5 percent in the UK, um, we're actually seeing that certainly on a sparse site, you have the chance of really missing a lot of the archaeology present. And does that mean that we have this, um, you know, are we only finding our dense sites? Are we only finding our multi-period sites? Are we biasing our archaeological interpretation towards multi-periodicity? Are we only finding our Neolithic pits when they're on top of our Roma villas? Yeah. It, yeah, his thoughts. Okay, um, and then another, uh, just a kind of taste of the results, is that looking at the size of the features, so to explain these graphs, uh, this is, these, these bars are presented as the rate, compared to the ratio of the actual features on site. So, the archaeological population of the site, let's say, say a third was the large features. Um, in the evaluation, it's how much percentage were your large features in the evaluation. So how much is your trenching um, showing the population of your site? Um, and here we see that the numbers of your large features are overrepresented, but actually the area, though you do have a lot of uh, a huge amount of variation, is a, perhaps a better indication. Though you do get, again, a huge amount of variations at low amounts of trenching. And then finally, also with small features, you have a huge underrepresentation. You're not likely to find your small features in your trenching layouts. The ratio of your small features is not reflective of how many small features are on site. And though this might look curious, this side with the area of the small features. It's because, in fact, the small features take up so little area on site that to underrepresent them in your sample, there's not so much of a way you can go down. Anyway, so that's the taste of just modeling trenching in isolation. Um, and the next step for that is inputting large scale mitigation data of sites and seeing where there has been significant archaeology and um, seeing how well they find the actual significant archaeology. Would we have made the same value judgments? So the next step is, is to look at how well, because um, trenching isn't always used in isolation. It's actually um, trying to test how well we can use um, previous data to test how well our trenching works with the geophysics. And this is what we actually touched, what you, what you guys have done on HS2. And so what the idea was, the idea was to kind of simulate your study and have a, if we have a, I'm aware I'm running out of time. So it was to use the mitigation data from sites. So this is the same site I showed earlier. Um, and you have an area which has been both gone to mitigation, you've got the geophysical survey, and then you've trenched. And then you can compare how well both the geophysical survey and the trenching, or any other technique, matches the subsequent mitigation. And then you can begin, if you go forward, so that's an example of how I would imagine the results to look. And I've written this model, but I don't have the data yet. A lot of it's trying to go through people's CAD interpretations, which takes time. But the idea then being, you can then get a deposit model, and you can see how well these different techniques work in the different, and have a landscape model, which um, you know, is moving on from Ruth Waller's work and um, the work done on HS2 and yours, Lucy. So um, this was going to end with, can I please have the spatial data of geophysical survey <laughs> mitigations <laughs> and um, evaluation trenching? Uh, and, yeah, and please talk to me afterwards. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>